pretty soon. Let's welcome everyone who is now joining us on YouTube. Sorry, we weren't able to put it on our YouTube thing last week, but because I was yeah, we we're having some technical issues, and we'll put this up a little bit later. But we're so excited to be together today as we have a bunch of wonderful people, including two Just new ones. So welcome, Bob. Yeah. Yeah. Just talking. Glad to have you guys. Welcome to, of course, Michael and Noel and Ron and Arlene and Larry. And I don't know if Jane's there and Stuart, I don't know if Karen's there. And if, so we are ready for an exciting discussion. As you can imagine, we're all now deciding again what we're going to be doing for our holidays because the mayor Anna has uh, put out some news. So we'll keep everybody informed as to what we're going to do because we actually don't know. Uh, Rosh Hashanah is uh, about a week and a half away and we're still not sure. <laughs> so be generous and kind to all of us. I have one question. They're on. Um, I, I, I always get your messages, but for some reason, it, it, I lose it. Is there any way to save the, the, your message with, with the link? Um, I'll have, yes. You mean on YouTube or on the phone? I mean, on email? Uh, no. Uh, yeah, on email. Oh, yeah. I'll, call, I'll talk to you later about how to do that. No okay. worries. Right. And, and we're looking forward to still going to film you guys at 11 tomorrow. Yes. Today, we are going to be talking about... Uh, Jewish myths, superstition, and Bubba Mises, which is great because there's so many of them and so many that are indigenous to certain sects of Judaism that most of them we probably have heard, but there's going to be a lot we may not have, or there are going to be some that we've heard and don't know the origins, uh, because the origins, quite frankly, aren't always clear. But there's a lot of debate. And so we'll go through some of them and then invite you guys to bring up your own, because as we know, there's tons. And again, as we mentioned before, there are customs and laws. Some of the Baba Mises have to do with traditional laws that you find in the Talmud in the Bible. And others are customs that have cropped up through the years that may have a basis. Uh, Stuart, do you have a question? And you're still on, you're still on uh, mute, Stuart. If, if I may, uh, I came across this week what I think might be a special introduction to today. So I can either wait for you to finish what you're doing, or I think I think bring it up. I can't because I'm I'm ready now. Let's do it, man. In the 13th century. There was written the equivalent of a novel, a romance novel, something of the style of Ivanhoe and Robin Hood. And it was about, in England, about one Sir Bouvet, uh, who was a knight in Hastings in what is now England. And that story, that romance story, became incredibly popular. And was translated into many, many languages over the centuries, including ultimately getting to be Italian. And from the Italian translation of the story of Sir Bouvet of Hastings. Sir Bouvet. Right? It was. Sir Bouvet. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Can I go to a different computer? No. Uh, I, this Sir Bouvet. We want okay, Karen to stay. 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 The, the Serbobe of Hastings, uh, it got translated from the Italian to Yiddish. And these stories were then written by one of the Yiddish writers. This was now, by now, the 18th, 17, 18th or 19th century, became very, very popular. And they ended up being called. There were two names, and you can look these names up. This is legitimate. I'm, this is not one of my Bouvet Mises. All right. Uh, you can look it up. They were listed as Bouvet, Buch, B U V E, B U C H, but spelled with the Hebrew letters or Bouvet stories. Well, if you look at the spelling of Bouvet in Yiddish, it's Beit Vav Beit which is the same spelling as Bubba, because you don't have the accent. 
And that indeed, in Yiddish, they started to be called not the Bouvet stories, but the Bouvet Mises or the Bubba Mises. And that legitimately is the origin of the term Bubba Mises. It has nothing at all to do with our grandmothers. <laughs> Very cool. True. True. I will tell Bubba Rosenthal that. <laughs> Our past presidents. Huh? That is very cool. I had no idea. So that's some cool learn. So if you look up I'm Bouvet book, oh. Bouvet book, yeah, in Yiddish, that's you get that story in many many places. That's pretty cool. Okay, so let's talk about some of the Bubba Mices and some of the actual laws. I'll go through a couple, but again, we're going to invite people to bring them up. I think obviously the most famous or one of the most famous would be tattoos. And that is one of the superstitions a lot of people have that if you wear a tattoo, it's going to mark you and you cannot be buried in a Jewish cemetery. You won't go to heaven. It is a, it's, and, and there's biblical passages like Leviticus, which says you shall not make ashes in your flesh. And in uh, the Mishnah, if a man wrote on his skin, pricked in writing, he's is not culpable unless he writes it and pricks it with ink or eye paint or anything that leaves a lasting mark. So again, it, saying if it's a lasting mark, then it is a prohibition. It's pro pro prohibited in the to Tosafot and a certain passage in the Talmud. So it seems that it is very obvious that you're not supposed to do tattoos. It's prohibited under the law of the Elim, where it created in the image of God. And our bodies, of course, are on loan, and that the tattoos themselves are, are, are idolatrous. The question is not whether Judaism says don't do it. The question is the penalties. And the penalties are very, and I'm going to use incorrect English, very not major. So for all the talk about not having a tattoo and how terrible it is, in reality, it's not considered by Judaism to be that bad of a thing. It's a very minor thing to do it for a lot of reasons. There's no rule that says if you have a tattoo, you can't be buried in a Jewish cemetery. Okay. If, even if you tattoo yourself, not counting you know, people who are tattooed against their will. So it's interesting that really it's become one of the major superstitions that we teach our kids don't get a tattoo because then you'll never be able to be buried or some would say you don't even go into heaven. And that is not true at all. There's a lot of reasons, but what has modernity done to help make this issue almost a non-issue these days? In fact, my nephew was just telling me the other day when we went on vacation, not the other day, about a month ago, he just turned 19. He wants to get some tattoos. So his father, of course, and mother were coming to me saying, no, if you get a tattoo, you can't be buried in a Jewish cemetery. And so what am I supposed to say when I know that is not true at all? I said, of course, you definitely you won't be able to be buried in a Jewish cemetery. And I had my fingers crossed behind my back. <laughs> but there's actually no prohibition. And it's funny enough that my nephew, who is 19 and not that well versed in Judaism, knew one of the right answers as to why, which was very interesting because he knew that today, guess what you can do to a tattoo? You can remove it. Yeah, laser answer. technology. Right. He said, okay. Robert, I can have it removed with laser technology. It's not a rule unless it's stuck on your body forever. And funny enough, he is actually right that the prohibition is against, now obviously they didn't have laser technology, you know, the prohibition is against actual tattoos, not what we call henna tattoos, but with new laser technology, all tattoos, I guess, are henna again. Plus, the prohibition is don't do it. There's no, nothing that says you can't be buried in a cemetery or you won't go to heaven. It's kind of like saying, if you covet something from somebody, you can't be buried in a cemetery. Obviously, nobody would be buried in a Jewish cemetery except for me because I'm a rabbi <laughs> and I don't covet what other people have. <laughs> um, if you lie, you can't be buried in a Jewish cemetery. Obviously, that's not true because I want to be buried in a Jewish cemetery and I just lied about the fact that I don't covet. 
So <laughs> prohibitions against tattoos, yes. You do find that, but there is nothing in there that makes it so bad that you can't be buried. It is like not considered akin to murder. It's again akin to breaking but sell Elohim, but so is a lot of other things like drinking Coca-Cola, which is not healthy for you, or, drink, or you know, doing drugs, which is actually much worse than tattoos. Any thoughts on tattoos? I know all of you have one. And so now I know you all feel relieved that you are all safe now. Uh, Larry. I don't think so. It's such a joke. Yes, it's I know. Such a humor. But we probably all have a child or so who does have it. All right, Larry, did you have some? Larry? I, we can't hear you for some reason, Larry. It's on maximum. And, and Bob and all you guys, your picture's off. Just to let you know. And Larry, did you want to say something? Okay. I think Larry's froze or is everybody froze? No, we're okay. no our no, picture was off. He just said our picture. Okay, there we go. I think Larry, Larry, I think you are frozen. So we may want to come back to you. Any other thoughts on tattoos? We'll wait for Larry to get back to us. No, I didn't. Right, so that's probably the most famous one. I put it back on. There's a lot of other ones. One of the ones, of course, which is the same as body piercing. If you're not allowed to body pierce, because with Selim Elohim, you're, you're, you're uh, created, we're created in the image of God. Is body piercing considered the same thing as tattoos? The answer is absolutely no. Yeah. Tattoos and body piercings are completely different categories. Why? Because in the Bible and the Talmud, it says you're permitted to have piercings in certain circumstances. Piercings are allowed. Um, it says in one or two more than one places that you put piercings in your ears or your nose as decorations. A slave or a servant who wants to remain a servant forever has their ears pierced. So there are lots of places where piercings are said they're allowed. So what is the debate today? The debate is what kind of piercings are allowed? And this is a very, this is probably one of the most difficult rules to keep because it's so vague. You're supposed, you're allowed to do a piercing if it is considered basically an alluring custom of the people of the day. So in other words, women wearing earrings 50 years ago would be considered fine 50 years ago because it's a tradition or custom in so many worlds. In the Jewish world, is it? except even in maybe the ultra-Orthodox, women having a piercing, does that really offend anybody today? Did it offend anybody 50 years ago? If a woman was wearing pierced earrings 50 years ago or 100 years ago or 200 years ago, would it have been considered a Shonda? The answer is, Michael? Oh, no, I don't have the answer. Go ahead. Answer. Okay, the answer is absolutely not. So the question is, what do we consider a Shonda in our particular circumstances today? Michael. But I did have a question. Sure. If it's uh, based on uh, the customs, uh, does that include the, you know, the non-Jewish? Two questions. One, does that include the customs of the non-Jewish world? And what about the first person who does it when it's not a custom? And in fact, that person kind of, you, you would say, probably they would say rebellious, you know, so would it have been allowed then before it's a custom? That is an excellent question. And that really goes to the very heart of Jewish law and Jewish custom. There's two ways to create laws, according to Judaism. One, the leader creates a law. I am the king. I am the prophet. I am the priest. I am whoever. I'm making a law. Everyone has to wear black shoes. That's the law. 
I'm making it the law of the land. That's one way. The other way is it becomes so popular that the ruler has no, he has only two choices to try and quell this or to say, I say it. So let's say everybody in the kingdom loves black shoes. We're all wearing black shoes and the ruler has two choices. He's either going to make it illegal or he's going to say it's legal and I'm going to start selling the only black shoes that should be bought. <laughs> That's what happens in Judaism. Something becomes so popular that the Jewish leaders have no choice but to make it a law. One good example is Hanukkah. The Jewish leaders in ancient times hated Hanukkah for a variety of reasons. They were not very supportive. The Hasmoneans were corrupt, a lot of things. So they tried to get rid of Hanukkah. But it was so popular, they, hadn't, they couldn't get rid of it. So they had to make rules for Hanukkah. They kind of made it a small, insignificant holiday because they couldn't get rid of it. And that is what we're talking about with Michael. Nose piercings 50 years ago would have been considered probably not part of Jewish law. I mean, you would have been ostracized, considered a rebel, considered a lunatic. It would have been crazy. Your parents now, do we consider nose rings against Jewish law? It's a debate because I know lots of Jews, especially it's not as popular today as it was in, uh, 10 years ago, but it was really popular and it's still pretty popular. I walk down the street in Savannah, I see nose rings all the time. So it is much more acceptable today. So it might be considered not against the law because it's so popular in America today. Another one would be guys wearing earrings. 50 years ago, 60 years ago, that was a no-no. Now, a guy wearing one earring, does anybody think that is like the worst thing you can do? Are you going to even blink when you see a guy wearing one earring here? No, it's so common that we might say in the Jewish world it is legal now because it's considered basically just an adornment. Which side? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's right. When I was growing up in the 80s, you could have it on your left side, but you couldn't have it on your right side. If you had it on your left side, it meant you were straight. If you had it on your right side, it meant you were gay, which was, I don't know if that was true or above a mice, but that's what uh, was when, they, you know, that was the viewpoint where I grew up. So earrings on a man or nose piercings may not be against the rules today because it may not break the rules of modesty anymore because it's so, you know, if, if, if my daughter came up to me and said, I'm going to get a nose ring as a rebellious, I'd probably be like, oh, thank goodness. That's better than drugs. It's better than alcohol. It's better than cigarettes. It's better than a tattoo. In five years, she takes it out. It heals itself. If my son says, I'm going to pierce my ears when he's 20, am I going to be upset about it? I'm going to say, no, thank goodness. That's how he's rebelling. Long hair, great. Ear, pier, piercing, piercing your ears, great. Preferable to tattoo, drugs, alcohol, leaving Judaism. It is nowhere near any big deal if my son, when he gets older, wants to have an earring or my daughter may have a nose piercing for a few years. Um, so, Larry, let's see if it works for you. See if it works now. Sorry about that earlier. And you're still on mute. Hear me now? Now we can. Perfect. Yeah. I was just going to ask Do you, you want to get close to it, Larry, because I can barely hear you. Are, 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 are any of these... Um, um, she's from Texas. They, oh, she's she's the Texas. Yeah. Or, are any of these prohibitions or, or um, what we think of as prohibitions included in the 613 commandments? Yes, yeah, some of them are. Um, so face the skin. So they're not rabbinical. They're, they're more like um, um, Talmud. Some or, of them are rabbinical. Some of them are directly from the Bible. You're right. It's a mixture um, because some of them like spitting three times. Obviously, that is they, they will preface that by pointing to a passage in the Bible. But as we know, 
There's no law against that. We'll talk about that in a second. But you're right. Some of them go all the way back. Piercing and tattoos, those prohibitions go back in some ways to the Bible. But so do the allowances for women wearing earrings or adorning yourself in a way that it's customary. And this answers your question also, Michael, about the outside world. I'm Jewish. I'm living in San Francisco, New York, LA, big cities where the changes come really early on. And all of these non-Jewish guys are wearing earrings in one ear. And all of a sudden, my son becomes the first Jewish guy to do it. But it's so popular. It's in movies. It's all around the city. All his friends are doing it. He's in college. He's legally allowed to make his if he's the first Jew, it may be said that he is breaking the law because no Jews wear earrings. But a year later, when half of all Jewish men age 20 are wearing earrings, then again, it's not considered prohibition anymore because it's <laughs> we're doing it. It's the will of the populace. You know, that, that's following the body. That's kind of, that, that's kind of interesting in, in a sense yeah. because oh. if, if you think of the we got a lot of cross talk. Go ahead, Michael. Okay, I mean, in a sense, that's kind of interesting because if you think about it, I, I think this is a pretty good analogy. Let's say you get a speeding ticket for going uh, 55 miles an hour on the highway because the speed limit's only 45, and then a year later, the speed limit's raised to 60 because they suddenly realize, you know, the traffic can, uh, can go that fast. That doesn't mean that you get a refund of your fine or the points get taken off. Exactly. You, you've still, you know, done something wrong. Right, exactly. That is 100% true. And again, remember, these populist decisions are not for every rule. Don't murder. If you live in an area where people where it's legal to murder, Judaism still says, wait a minute, that's not okay. But there are certain rules that it is okay, to, like this one with the piercing. That is okay. It's not considered, uh, and when it becomes an adornment, it's not an ethical law anymore. Larry. And you're, you just put yourself on mute, Larry. There you go. Many of the Jewish, many of the Jewish customs were to set us aside from uh, the non-Jews, right? Do you yes, think they were. Many of these were probably uh, just like the kashrath was one of the reasons for kashrath was set us aside. You know, um, but also, um, I don't know. There may have been other reasons, but um, these seem to be to to distinguish Jews from non-Jews. In some ways, yes. Now, there again, there are certain laws that are ethical in nature and certain laws that are not. The laws that are ethical are not necessarily there to separate us because we believe those laws should be shared and that others would follow them. But the other, the other laws that are not, you're right. In some ways, holidays, holidays are for Jews. It separates us if we, you know, and so we're celebrating our holidays and you're celebrating your holidays. It's a way to separate in some ways or to create distinction, so definitely. But some rules like earrings go back and forth. You know, it's, 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 a, it's a lot more difficult to police. Like eating pork, we don't eat pork. So my daughter can't go eat at this person's house because they don't keep kosher. That's a lot easier than an earring because they're wearing earrings and they can't police that as much as my daughter wears earrings so she can't go to their house because that person's wearing earrings. It's not the same severity in terms of, so some rules are a lot more bendable and changeable than others. So one of the rules that is a little bit more, oh, Noel, do I end up? Yes. Uh, I'm coming from a different perspective because I've always been uh, an art instructor at the museum, and, and I ha always had a fascination for tattoos as an art thing and for piercings. And I've studied, from my point of view, the issue of body piercings 
and tattoos for years. And I tried, I didn't make it a religious thing. I tried to approach it as this is a historical thing. So that if there were Jews in my class or non-Jews, they could see, you know, the design of a tattoo. The, and I've seen, after studying this for years and years, some of the most horrible body piercings where they would put these things in a person's body and, hang, and drag them around a tree. Uh, I mean, it's just, it just has amazed me, but it's just it's one of those things I was fascinated with. And to this day, uh, I, I have a fascination for the design in tattoos. I'm not into, you know, specific things, but that's one of the ways I taught design. And what right or wrong, you can see all this artwork behind me and my ironing. I'm, I'm different. <laughs> well, you, but I, I, you say you're different now, yeah. but no, you're not. You were ahead of the game because now tattoos are not seen as prohibited as before uh, because it's become one, so popular, two, because they can be removed, and three, because a lot of people realize okay. It's yeah, not that big of a book. Okay. You know, I mean, traditionally, I you I can That's make a, 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 saying okay. it is Range very of. legal, very clearly, but I could also make a point saying it is not legal very clearly. So there is a lot of you know tattoos is not a set rule like the next one we're talking about, which is cremation. But then I'm talking about the three three major ones that three of the major ones that discussed. Two of them are not as big a deal as you might think. Uh, piercings and tattoos. There is prohibitions, but there's also a lot of ways around the prohibitions. And even if you're breaking the rule, it's not really that big of a, it's not like a huge deal compared to other things. Um, but I will, if a mother comes up to me and says her 16 year old son wants to have a tattoo, can you tell me, tell him it's not legal, then what am I going to do? I'm going to say, you're not allowed to have that tattoo. It's very obvious in Judaism. But as people get older, then obviously it changes. So um, cremation, and some people are mute and some are not. Is cremation the same as body piercings and as tattoos? The answer is absolutely not. Cremation is a whole nother level. That is a very, very strict rule. But Selim Elohim is in the image of God. That's combined with the idea that the body hold the body is a holy vessel for the spirit, combined with the belief that the body in some places is going to be resurrected in the next world in the next world, has made cremation a very, very big no-no. You are not allowed to bury someone who's cremated in a lot of Jewish cemeteries. I don't think any conservative cemeteries or Orthodox cemeteries would allow you to bury someone who's cremated. Uh, Reform cemeteries, it'll depend upon the congregation, but many of them, if not most, say yes, because otherwise there's no place to bury someone if they want to be buried in a Jewish cemetery. So cremation is a major prohibition. Uh, unlike the previous two, we are supposed to go ashes to ashes, just like we were created. We are, and by natural, by God creating us, we're supposed to be allowed to naturally die. Now, of course, there's always exceptions. If someone is killed or someone is it's done against their wishes, then that exception might be very possible to be yes. If you're killed and somebody does it to you without your consent. That's a whole different, but I'm saying in generally speaking, if my, if I say I want to be cremated and I choose that way, then I will not be allowed to be buried in an Orthodox or conservative synagogue. Uh, no. Yes. What if you are cremated, you're in a situation where you can be cremated and you want your ashes spread 
in a certain place. Is that forbidden? According to Judaism, yes. Now, again, this is according to traditional Judaism. You're not allowed you, cremation, even to this day, although the numbers are going up, it's still a small percentage of Jews who are cremated, even in the liberal world. The idea is, again, the body is supposed to decay. There are even some who would say that being cremated could affect your place in the next world because you can't be resurrected, which, again, is not my belief. But this is now it is becoming more and more popular, though, as I said, the numbers are rising of Jews who are being cremated for a couple reasons. One, space. It's considered like, you know, a little bit more natural. And you're not taking up space with, uh, with uh, boxes and with mausoleums. Number two, expense. It is a lot cheaper to be cremated than have a full burial, you know, a full burial funeral is going to cost you $10,000 in some places, in some places a lot more. Minimally, we're talking minimally four to 5,000. So it's not, an, it's a, it's not a, it's an insignificant amount of money. And so it has, Larry. I was just want to ask, is there any exception for uh, cremation for disease? Like I remember, you know, you see a lot of movies of the Black Death and things like that when people were burned because, uh, you know, of the fear of disease. A hundred percent. Did you that at all? Yeah, there is a hundred percent exception for anything that is health related for somebody else. And that, again, is a definite yes. Again, if you're cremated to save other people's lives, if you're cremated because of you were murdered and somebody else, if you were cremated by a family member against your will, these are all things that would be considered, okay, you still may not be able to be buried in a Jewish cemetery depending on what the circumstances, but those are not, there's always exceptions and those are the exceptions. Now, uh, Flossie. Yes, can, you could see me, okay. You <laughs> we're moving around, oh, okay. Right. I know it used to be suicide. You could not be buried in a Jewish cemetery. Then they got around it that a person who committed suicide might have a form of mental illness. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. And now I feel in most cemeteries you can't. So I guess what you're proving that in time, many of the superstitions, taboos, can be worked around and altered and changed. Exactly. And suicide is another one. That one is a very similar one to cremation when it comes to burial. Suicide, again, it's the same thing. It is breaking B'Tselem Elohim. God gave you this body. You committed suicide. You are breaking the several rules. One, it's considered self-murder. Obviously, murder is against the rule. Now, there's always going to be exceptions you know, martyrs, or if you, there's three exceptions to suicide, basically, if you're going to be forced to kill somebody else, you can choose to kill yourself. If you're going to be forced to commit some sort of heinous sexual act, then you can kill yourself. If you are going to be forced to convert to another religion. So those are the three times you can commit suicide legally, and it's, and it's, it's and you can be buried. And Flossie hit the nail on the head when what's going on today because of modern medicine, modern psychology, modern physiology, modern biology. This particular rule is getting circumvented quite a bit, if not most of the time. I'd say most of the time, People who commit suicide are still buried in Jewish cemeteries, even if it's a traditional one, for several reasons. One, and the most obvious, the person can be declared mentally unable to make decisions. And therefore, that, that right there takes care of it. The person was, because you put it under the person was sick. Number two, if you don't bury somebody in a Jewish cemetery, you're right there telling everyone that the person committed suicide. And it could be considered a stain on his, hers, or her family's legacy. Yeah. So 
In many cases, when people commit suicide, it is not said that they committed suicide. For, you know, what did they die of? I don't know. And that still happens to this day all the time. So, but if you don't bury that person in the cemetery, then everybody knows what happened. So that's another way of getting around it. Are there still people commit suicide and not allowed to be buried in cemeteries? Yes, it still happens, but not like cremation. Larry. I was just wondering about uh, if a person does wish to be cremated, um, are the Jewish customs of uh, sitting Shiva, um, are they violated? The, the person, um, I mean, because the family then is, uh, it's up to them to carry on certain parts of the Jewish customs and your site and all of the other things. I mean, or are they just kind of lost to Judaism, I guess, uh, you know, like in the Catholic religion, they're uh, excommunicated. There's, no, no, that's an I, excellent I question, Larry. If someone chooses cremation, all the other rules are still held. You still have Shiva, you still have yard site, you still light the candle, because a lot of those rules are for the living, to honor the dead. So that would mean the living is breaking another, it's like breaking another rule. It's like saying, I'm going to kill someone because I think he's going to kill me. You know, two wrongs don't make a right. So my father, uh, he, which he didn't, wanted to be cremated. I couldn't do anything to stop it. I still do everything, still yard sites, still everything, because that is my way to honor him. If I say, well, he's cremated, I'm not going to do any of these things, then it's two wrongs don't make a right. That's basically it. So yes, you still would. And uh, suicide, again, is very different, though, than cremation, because suicide it's much easier to circumnavigate the law for that. Cremation, it has to be somebody who is cremated against their will, which does not happen very often, certainly not in the modern world or modern free societies. So that is a very rare exception today, whereas uh, suicide is very often the person will be buried in a cemetery. I'd say most of the time. Larry, um, no, Stuart. I think what I'm seeing here is sort of two levels. First of all, there's a level of, there are three levels or more of law that I think we have. We have what it's essentially the written Torah law, which is in a large sense harder to circumvent, the rabbinic law and perhaps Talmudic interpretation fits somewhere between those two. And then we have law or rules based on custom. And I think those hold different levels of activity. And then on top of or overarching all of those is the nature of interpretation. Because we read a law in Torah, and then we have to decide, does this action fit within that? Is allowing yourself to be murdered to prevent someone else from dying, is that suicide or is that not suicide? And I think that's what we have to deal with. And then I would put on sort of one other layer, how difficult is it to protect the family, I'll put it this way, to take some other action? Uh, it's very easy, I think, if somebody commits suicide to say, oh, we bury that person elsewhere in another town or whatever, just as at one time we would take an unmarried woman who became pregnant and send her off to another town to have the baby. So the family was protected and nobody knew. Uh, with cremation, I think that's a lot harder to do because of the obvious precursors. And I think all of those things end up coming into the decision. So what's getting changed in some sense is really only the interpretation and perhaps not much else. And that's true. And it's always dependent on the people of the community itself. Certain rules are especially unethical rules. Ethical rules are a little bit easier to keep because we understand them. There's always changes and alterations what does, what's the definition of murder? That is up to us and our legalities, but don't murder is 
don't steal. I mean, these are ethical laws versus cremation, which is not an ethical law because it's not affecting anybody else, versus suicide, although suicide might be considered ethical because it's self, I'd say more tattoos are, is not an ethical one. So you're right. It's always going to be dependent upon society and the rules of the, you know, for the cemetery, it's going to be dependent upon what the, whoever's in charge of the cemetery makes the rules. What do they say? No. Yes. I'm not going to mention the name, but I have a rabbi friend who had a twin sister who was on life support. And I said to the, to my rabbi, I said, you're the one that's going to have to make the decision to pull the plug, so to speak. And I said, I said, how are you going to do that? And she said, I have to. And so I don't know where something she, the, the twin sister got well and it didn't have to happen, but where does something like that fit in? That's, I mean, that's not part of superstitions, but that is a very big part of Jewish law as the, we've talked about it before, the fine, the fine line between murder and letting someone die. In Judaism, letting someone die, and for those reasons, is very legal. Turning off the plug is very legal if the person's going to die naturally. Putting a knife through their heart is not. Even if they're in pain, you can let them, it's a difference, like my, the, my, my father is in terrible pain, but he's not going to die on his own. He's not on a ventilator. There's no plug to pull. That is a much more difficult question in Judaism because pulling the plug, definitely, there's a lot of, 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 uh, a lot of uh, literature and, and, and laws on that. But that's, that's a good question. Um, let's go to a couple less severe ones because it's getting to be so. So what are some of the other, as, um, as um, Stuart said, Bubba Mises? Spitting three times. This is one that I think if we haven't seen it in our family, which again, I did not grow up with the Yiddish kite because uh, I am uh, too far. Uh, my family came way before I was born. So uh, my, my, all my grandparents who I knew were born in America. Um, so, but you see it in movies all the time. Uh, Hester Street, I think is the first time I saw it. Uh, and I also the first time I saw the salt in the in the pockets, which I did not know uh, when it happened. I had asked somebody, what is, why, why are they doing that? So spitting three times, obviously that is not a Jewish law. There is nothing in Judaism that says you can't spit three times. But through the years, it has become a very popular tradition of spitting to ward off the evil eye. You know, three is one of those important Jewish numbers. And so it's used. Some people even believe it is based on Christian traditions from the New Testament, which is interesting enough because Christians don't really do that traditionally anymore, but it's stayed in the Jewish world. What is the poo poo poo? Poo 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 is the exact same thing as spitting, but it's kind of like spitting is considered degrading today or no good human being would spit. So I say poo, 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 as if I'm spitting to ward off. Has anybody had family members who have had this tradition? I have not. Uh, Michael has, uh, and, and it looked like, uh, Karen, you said you did. I'm trying to, well, I'm trying, not sure. I wasn't there. I think there's a scene in Fiddler on the Roof where she does. Oh, that. maybe Fiddle on the Roof also. Yeah. Yeah. And Fiddle on the Roof is a very, Fiddle on the Roof is the best movie for any of this stuff because it became a major hit, and so many Jews have seen it, so many non-Jews have seen it, whether you've seen the movie or the play. It is an exception to the rule, because most of this literature and stuff has stayed in the Jewish world. This is the exception that kind of went, uh, you know, like a book that goes popular outside the Jewish world once in a while. So that's one of them, and some believe it goes back to Mark or even John, those books. Some other ones that I have not seen, but... I've heard of, well, first of all, putting salt. I have not seen that myself, but I've seen it in movies. Karen? Well, I was thinking one that my grand, I know when my son was born, he's my first child, my grandmother was very, you know, came from the shtetl and all that. 
uh, insisted I put a red ribbon on the crib. Yeah. Does anybody know about that one? Yes, threads in a variety of way are very, there are some who say you put the thread, there's some say when you're making something, you know, like you're crocheting something, you, you put thread in your mouth and bite on it. Uh -huh. That's another one. Um, these are not ones I've ever seen. These are ones I've read about. So just to make sure you know, um, whereas the salt is a lot more popular, but it's the same type of thing. Salt was considered not just in the Jewish world, but in the outside world to have certain powers. Even today, when you go to watch a horror movie, you'll see sometimes they play salt around the, the if they want to exercise, ex, what do you say, excise? No, exercise. Sure, yeah. Sure, sure, yeah. Yeah, so when they do an exorcism, they put salt around because salt has some sort of inherent qualities. I don't know where the origins of that is. Does anybody know where the origins of the salt comes in as to why salt has power? I do not know. So, I don't, no. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I know salt is a preservative uh, and because they used it to preserve food yeah. and things. And I don't know whether that has anything to do with it or not. That probably has a lot to do with it. That makes a lot of sense because it preserves life as it preserves mm -hmm. food. And again, why you put it in your pockets, that was, I don't know, uh, Larry. Yeah, salt, I know uh, we had visited Poland and one of the things that they pointed out to us in Poland was the salt mines. The salt mines for centuries were controlled by kings and the kings, that was their major source of wealth. That the fact that uh, salt became, um, aside from the fact that it has this crystalline substance in it, which looks like it's, you know, think of Superman, where he, you know, where he comes in and the crystals kind of meld together. I think there's this, um, this other business that the salt is a really way to wealth. Uh, Stuart. Salt goes back as a wealth issue way, way before that. Indeed, the word salary comes from the Latin word uh, that's involved with salt and the Roman legionnaires were paid in salt because it was such a useful and rare commodity. Hmm. So in ancient times, salt was not unlike gold. And we, I think in the modern, you know, the only time I really had any connection with the salt as some sort of valuable commodity was of course in India, we, you know, you grew up studying about Mahatma Gandhi and, you know, making their own salt and how the English prohibited them from making their own salt. We didn't always understand as students the meaning of it, why, you know, but because money, it was such a monetary source. But, you know, you remember Mahatma Gandhi walked in, made his own salt and was arrested for that, I think. Yeah. When I eat challah from a mochi, I always, always dip it in salt. Yeah. And a lot of people do that. It's a pretty... Yeah strong custom in fact you see that a lot that is that is a very common thing i mean almost almost it's almost assumed if you're doing it in a, an orthodox or conservative synagogue you will see salt almost for us we put it on beforehand so it's not uh but that is a really all right so let's go around because we only have a few minutes so instead of going the ones i have listed anybody else know of any flossy and you're still on me just let you know And Flossie, you're on mute, just to make sure you. We'll go to Michael, then we'll go to Flossie, because Flossie, you're still on mute. I, I, I've never heard this from anyone else, but my grandmother used to get very upset if it rained on the second day of Pesach. She, her superstition was that meant war. Has, has anybody ever heard that? No. I would have thought the opposite, that it was considered good luck. Yeah, I, that's right. That's right. But again, this, the, day, the second day of Sukkot is when you're supposed to start the prayer for rain. So maybe it's not supposed to be for one more day. That's interesting. I've never heard that. You well, know, Rabbi, what you just said uh, is very... Okay. Go ahead, Ron. What you just said... Okay. What you just said is very interesting. In fact, for the good luck, on my next margarita, I'm going to have it a salt on the rim. All right. <laughs> that's a very Jewish over your shoulder. Yeah, that, that, that was created it. by all the Jews who were kicked out of Spain, who immigrated eventually to Mexico. 
Uh, Flossie. Okay, we're on. The, the person who controlled it came back in the room. What about naming someone? Oh. I've heard that there's a superstition. You can't name after a child that died. Also, can you cross genders? Can you name a child after, let's say, a girl or a boy after vice versa? And that naming is a very big, is just one big Bubba Mice after the other, one big tradition after the other. There's a lot of traditions when it comes to naming. The most obvious is in the Ashkenazic world, not the German Ashkenazic, the Eastern European Ashkenazic, you don't name a child after someone who's living. Some would say you don't name a child after a child who's died or that you do. Um, the, what we've learned at our synagogue here in Mikvah Israel, that is not a Jewish tradition because even to this day, we have a lot of members who name their children after their uh, living, like our last two presidents, Charles Harris and Baba Rosenthal, both were named, for, had the same name as their parent, their fathers who were alive um, when they were born. So again, in my world, when I grew up, you do not name someone after someone who's living. My parents would have never done that. I would not do that. But that's because it's the Ashkenazic tradition. The Sephardic world, it doesn't exist. And in the German Jewish world, apparently, at least the German American Jewish world, it doesn't. Larry. Larry. Larry, and then, oh, and then we'll come back to the I was going to mention two others that come to mind. One, of course, is from Fiddler on the Roof, which is uh, the dream about uh, that she takes place, which I thought was really inventive about how people, you know, and people do believe that dreams were precursors. I mean, going back to Joseph and everything, you know, and that you could predict it. But he uses this artifice of the dream because his, um, I guess his wife really believed in, you know, that the dreams were um, uh, precursors of the, uh, you know, of telling the truth there. But the other one was we were just watching an Israeli movie, which was kind of interesting. And it's about, um, they, they have this um, um, matchmaker person and the matchmaker, uh, this is in an Orthodox community. And she tells um, the wife of the, um, uh, of the son who she wants to introduce to a, um, to a young girl uh, when they go to see their family, they should bring the foreskin of the um, um, from from the circumcision of um, a child who had been um, um, you know just circumcised uh, by some prominent rabbi, and they should wrap it into a bendel, a real a rag, and uh, when they don't see anything, they should try and place it underneath the bed of the girl. And uh, this is kind of the superstition to bring good luck. And um, it's really funny because uh, apparently they all knew about the superstition. And when uh, in the movie, it's really cute because what happens is that uh, after they leave, the young girl's sister, you know, her younger sister goes under the bed. She retrieves it, knowing that somebody had probably done it. And she gives it to the mother. The mother puts it in the closet with about a dozen other ones that she had there. <laughs> so I don't know if people have heard of this thing of using the foreskin, you know. But that is uh, not a tradition we have in my family. It really and the purpose yeah, of that, very the purpose of that was not good luck. It was to bring the first child to be a male child. That could be it, yeah. That, that was really what the purpose yeah, of that was. Lawsuit. Going back to my question before, my question basically was, can you cross gender? Can you name a baby girl after a boy or vice versa? I think you can. Or, I don't know. If there may be prohibitions. Again, it, the prohibition in Judaism is about names, giving a boy a girl's name and a girl a boy's name. That, of course, is really difficult, again, to police because, you know, names and popularity of names change over time. But yes, there is some prohibition against or Bama Misa against naming somebody uh, from uh, the opposite sex, the opposite gender. Yeah, but I don't, I haven't, I haven't seen that very often. I haven't seen that personally. So, but you guys may have been more familiar with that. Uh, Karen and Stewart. I was just, I'm named after my grandfather's brother. So it was Salman. 
Did you, that's yeah. how they can't run. Yeah. Like, it's Stuart. a question often of modifying the name so Shalom becomes Shlamit. Yeah. Uh, when my son was, my grandson was born, uh, my late, my first wife, the, the grand, who would have been the grandmother, had died. And her name was Rachel. So what we did was, and Rabbi helped us think of this, was put the word me, the Hebrew word me, who, within the name, and we changed Rachel to Rachmiel. So my grandson yeah. has a name now, essentially meaning who is Rachel. And in that way, we named him after his uh, uh, grandmother. And so I think you get a lot of that with a slight alteration of the, uh, of the name. Yeah, and I think these are all interesting. I'm sorry, Jane. Uh, I think that's, you know, again, this one is something I've heard about, but I've never done. And Jane, you're still on on uh, on mute, by the way. Okay. I'm always, I'm, Jane, we may need you to come a little closer. I don't think your mic is very loud. Larry, can you Sorry about me? that. You may just need to turn up the settings on that one. Can you hear me? Now I can. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's funny that you say that about names because in my family and my grandmother was very orthodox. Um, when the first five grandchildren were girls, my grandfather had no name. So, of course, they were going to name him after my grandfather. The first five kids all have the same name. His name was Joseph. In Hebrew, it was Zorach, which has nothing to do with Joseph. And everybody was Zelda. We have five Zeldas in our house. <laughs> wow. And I guess it must have been okay because, you know, it wasn't until the sixth grandchild was born that it was a boy. Wow. That's like George Foreman. Rabbi. Right. Um, also, Ar Rabbi. Arlene. Yes. Well, we also talked <laughs> about about chicken soup. Chicken soup is the uh, Jewish penicillin. My grandmother used to always bring chicken soup no matter no matter who got sick. Even when I had the uh, um, chicken pox, I was cured by her chicken soup. Absolutely. The magic of chicken soup. And that is also translated. That's a Jewish tradition that's kind of gone outside of Judaism into the more into the non-Jewish world. Again, it's it's, you know, it's just interesting how these changes. I'll conclude with this story. When I had my first, uh, when my wife was pregnant with our first child, um, we took her to uh, to Hilton Head to get the imaging so we would learn if it was a boy or a girl. The place we go to now, now they all have it. But at that time, the place we were going. And so my mother-in-law and my wife really wanted to know the gender. So it was great. Okay, I was like, fine, I'm fine to know the gender. So they went and uh, I think I've sold this story. They, we found out it was going to be a girl. We drive back to Hilton Head. Where's the first place we go to? A girl's, a little girl's dress shop. <laughs> so they can buy all the clothes and the stuff. And I got that. I said, wait a minute, we're not supposed to buy anything until after the child is born, except for some necessities like diapers and stuff. We don't buy anything because it's a, against, you know, it's a poo, poo, poo. And uh, both my, you know, my wife, who is converted to Judaism, my mother-in-law is Catholic, just said, you know what, you can take an Uber home. <laughs> you can take so, an Uber home. Yeah. So that, that didn't fly in my household at all. So I didn't even try with my son. I will conclude with uh, Karen. No, I was just saying, you were, I had forgotten about that. But my same grandmother that made me put the red ribbon on the crib also was very sick. You know, you don't. We, nothing. There was nothing in the house until after my son was born that indicated that a child was coming. Yeah, it was just, yeah. just when I grew, I thought that was normal. I didn't realize it was not. So, yeah. But, uh, I, mean, I, I imagine that rule changed when so many Jewish people went into the mercantile business, the shmata business. Probably, yeah. they, they probably oh. wanted that one changed because okay, it gives you six months of people buying stuff, especially the grandparents. Well. All right, guys, next week. Wait, wait. I'm sorry, Ron, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, I, I, this is for Sue and Bob, and this is an inside thing. Sue and Bob, I love your couch. 
<laughs> the whole, the whole, we love yours. <laughs> the whole time I was, it's so funny because the whole time I was here during this class, I kept thinking to myself, I hope Jeff and Flossie and Sue and Bob get up and leave so I can just watch that couch. That's what I was waiting for. The <laughs> Maybe we'll tell you the story. I want to hear the story, lady. Tell me tomorrow. I'll see you tomorrow. All right. Next week, we're going to have our final class before the high holidays, which we're going to talk about how Jews in the world are doing today. Uh, kind of a special looking at the Pew study, but other things. And then as for the high holidays, we all have set what we're going to do. Uh, there may be changes ahead. So we're all meeting tonight because of the uh, COVID uh, rise in our area. So we'll see what we're going to do. We're not sh it's very scary to not only COVID, but, you know, as I said, uh, Rosh Hashanah is a week from Monday, and we're not 100% sure what we're doing, <laughs> so yeah. just changes happen so quickly, So, uh, but we're still going to have the class after our holidays. All right, guys, everyone stay safe, and always a pleasure, and Noel, especially to see our representative of Texas, and really great to see you, Bob and Sue, again, yeah. and again, stay Thank safe, you. everyone, and uh, we'll yeah. see you next week. Wonderful to see you. Don't forget, we have Larry, Sue, stay virtual on sleep. A minute. Virtual Slichot Saturday night, and Kelly and Jeff are going to be performing at the beginning. All right, guys, stay safe, everyone. Take care. Take care. Great, great to see you, Bob. Well, Tony, great to see you on a minute. Can you let us stay on for a minute, Rabbi?